My name is Leonard Hobbs. I'm the uh, chairperson of the Valencia Transatlantic Cable Foundation. And uh, we're delighted here to have what is now our third Valencia lecture. Um, if I could start just by welcoming some people, I'd like to welcome the mayor, uh, Niall Keller, and the deputy mayor indeed, as he also here. Also the minister, um, Minister Pascal Dunn, who has joined us, will be speaking today. In fact, the minister probably doesn't know this, but he actually started off this lecture series um, three years ago when he was here and he mentioned um, he came uh, to a dinner and, and referenced a book um, by a, a gentleman called Geoffrey Garton. And that night when I was home, my wife encouraged me to, to invite Geoffrey Garton the next year. And I did, and I wrote to him, and he said, I'll come, but it'll cost you $45,000. So, um, so thanks, Minister. Um, but, um, uh, but, but actually, he did, actually, he came. No, I did not. <laughs> I did not. <laughs> so, so we came, but that started the whole series, so thank, thank you for that. And, uh, and last year, uh, we were joined as well by a number of people, including uh, Professor Morris from, from, from Trinity, who's come back this year, so you're very welcome. Also, I'd like to welcome the public representatives here. There's a few few joining us. Uh, we have the former minister, former U.S. ambassador, Kevin O'Malley, who's going to speak with us as well, so we're delighted to have Kevin. And indeed, uh, we have uh, Mina Bueller from the Canadian Embassy here as well, so welcome, Mina. Also, I'd like to welcome Morris, more, I should mention Morris at the start, Morris Morell, who's the Chief Executive of Kerry County Council and a huge supporter of, of, of our entire programme here. So really, uh, really want to thank Maura for all her help and everything that we do. Um, and finally then, a very special guest, um, Jerry Osmond. Uh, Jerry is from uh, Canada. He's from Newfoundland um, and Labrador, where there is another, the other side of the cable. And, uh, and we're going to be doing um, our project, our heritage project, in collaboration uh, with Jerry. We didn't think Jerry existed. Uh, we just uh, we thought it was like an ABBA thing that it was he really wasn't there, but he does, and uh, and we're delighted to have him. And he's been, he's been very gracious the last few days in sharing his thoughts on on how, how they, what they have done. They're further ahead than we are, um, but a great experience, a wealth of experience in Canada in terms of UNESCO. They, they're very good at it. They've over 20 20 sites. They got more in the pipeline, so they're they're black belts at this thing. And we're really looking forward to learning from from their process now going forward. So um, I just uh, I just like to start again, if I could, uh, just to remember um, a friend of ours, dear friend of ours, Anthony, Anthony O'Connell, who passed away during the year. I think a lot of you here will know him. Uh, Anthony was a very special friend to me, to, to a lot of us. Um, was a wonderful, inspiring, and visionary um, individual uh, who really had the vision to do something here, and we're proud to honour that vision today and in the, indeed going forward. And it reminded me actually of a quote about another visionary. Um, uh, um, uh, Cyrus Field, and uh, who who um, who was the man who who drove this entire project, uh, the, the the transatlantic project, and uh, when the president President Higgins visited here back in February of last year, what he said about Cyrus Field, he said the man who was who decided he was going to put a cable across the Atlantic was the kind of person who the vision was told he couldn't be done, and but he prevails on the fourth attempt. Cyrus Field has done as as we must look how as far as as far as has done we must look to other global problems. Um, that haven't been solved and ask ourselves why they can't be done. So, so you know, today's lecture is about globalisation. Um, and uh, so we really look forward now to, uh, to our first uh, speaker today on, on that topic. And, and we, as we stand here both in the, in to, to honour the spirit of Anthony, Anthony O'Connell and indeed Cyrus Field, who, of whose birthday we, we celebrate the 200th anniversary this year. But anyway, without further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Danielle McCormick, who's from the Department of Heritage, and who's going to start us off to, to give us a little bit of context again about what, what this project is about. So, Danielle. Thanks very much, Leonard, for the introductions and for the invitation. On behalf of the department, we're really delighted to be here. I, I was asked to do the historical context. I, to be honest, didn't know where to start, and then I didn't know where to finish. Um, so today will be a bit of a snapshot, and hopefully it'll give some idea of the movements that were going on at the same time as the telegraph was laid. So the laying of the first transatlantic cable and the transmission of the first message between Heart's Content and Valencia. It was a historical event situated in many contexts. If you look at it closely, it was a feat of modern technology. It forms part of the history of technology and of communications. It was by far the most ambitious feat to then. Um, other submarine telegraph cables range between one and 115 miles in length. The second longest was 400 miles in length. This one was 1,950 miles in length. The story of the Valencia Transatlantic Cable Station is part of so many historical processes. As humans, we, we tend to focus on pinpoints, isolated events. Sometimes this can be misleading. Sometimes it can simplify what was happening in the past. But on other occasions, 
such events can genuinely give us a window into history. Um, sometimes they can be actually representative of the vast human endeavor that brought them about. There are certain events that can enrich understandings of history. And the laying of the transatlantic cable was definitely one such event. Indeed, it was recognized as such at the time. There was huge celebration, there was huge fanfare about it. So it is deserving of our special attention. But there was also a wider socioeconomic, political, and military context to this event. The first context to the cable station, however, was local, and it was Irish. Ireland in the 1850s was a period of change, it was a period of urbanization. Modernizing processes had been catalyzed by the famine. They really, they took off in the later 19th century. The famine led to an intensification of economic processes that were already in train, such as an increase in livestock farming, the continuance of subsistence level farming in the West. Large farmers increased their holdings, while large landlords, perhaps ironically, suffered a decline. They suffered a decline in rents and increasing rates. Catholicism in Ireland came to be practiced in a much more structured, organized, and systematic way. And this was because of measures that had been taken in the 1820s and 30s. Then by the 1850s, these measures started to bear fruit. They also combined with a need on the part of the populace in the wake of a collective trauma for spiritual guidance. So the Catholic Church was able to take advantage of that. It was also the era of the rise of the country shopkeeper and of urbanization. This period was also the period of urbanization, of literate culture, of the increase in print, of English language culture at the expense of oral culture and the Irish language. And as is well imprinted on the minds of many, including everyone here today, I'm sure we're all aware, that Ireland was suffering from mass emigration in the late 19th century. Emigration patterns accelerated against the background of the famine and they built on 18th century trends. Between 1845 and 1870, it is likely that at least 3 million people left the country. By 1890, nearly 40% of everyone who was born in Ireland lived abroad. There was also a pattern of seasonal migration, including to Newfoundland, as young people went there to work in the fisheries industries. Emigration was something that took place within structures that became formalized over time. There were processes of family and state aid to go abroad, and it was just a part of Irish culture in the period. It was accepted as a fact of life. And this had a positive effect for emigrants because as structures became more formalized, conditions of passage became better. Um, they evolved from the brutal, brutal circumstances in which people emigrated in the 1840s. As an example, 20% of emigrants from Ireland to Quebec in the 1840s died. The system of emigration led to an interdependence between regions of Ireland and the countries to which Irish people emigrated, and to a flow of people, of money, communications and ideas between those areas. Emigration from Ireland, interestingly, had a particularly female character. The growth of technology in the 19th century meant that there was less of a need for brute force and for physical strength. This was of an advantage to women who were able to emigrate and take advantage of a somewhat more favorable wage differential in America than that which prevailed in Ireland. Um, Newfoundland in Canada, which was of course at the opposite end of the transatlantic cable, they experienced their own economic pressures in this period. Policymakers at this time were seeking to diversify the economy from fishing to agriculture and to other industries. They also attempted to attract immigrants, but not in a systematic way. And their focus was on very specific immigrants, agriculturally skilled immigrants. However, there was an influx of Irish people from Ireland to Newfoundland in the 19th century, between 1850 and the early 1830s, when it tapered off because there were better prospects everywhere, uh, elsewhere. Telegraphic communication was, in this period, in many respects, the preserves of the elites. Um, it was mainly used by governments, by businesses, and by the press. Though Ireland and America were connected by socioeconomic migrants, by the forces of poverty, telegraphy was not readily accessible to them. Um, a 19th century edition of Scientific American relates as follows. 
One poor lady, whose husband had been detained in jail on account of his inability to pay a fine, imposed upon him for indulging in his weakness, as she termed it, begged a telegraph operator to tell her aunt in Darahini, Ireland, to send her the loan of $10. When informed that a New York merchant had just paid $57 for a dispatch of as many words to London, and that it would cost her about $10 to get a message to Ireland, she exclaimed, What's the good of a blessing that's so dear? And it is funny. Um, but what's also interesting to us now is the way that this was relayed in the 19th century. This is an 1850s edition of Scientific American, so very, very much on the cusp. It was related as an amusing anecdote, whereas today we might, we might look, a, look upon it with a little bit of sympathy. As well as being shaped by economic realities, Ireland was also shaped in this period by its intellectual context and its ideological context. This blended homegrown thought with ideas from the wider world. The intellectual and ideological movements of Ireland interacted directly with the evolving telecommunications infrastructure. Mid 19th century Ireland was a period of growth for Irish newspapers, and remember the press were principal customers of the telegraph system. This was the result of relaxation of regulation and lowering of taxes. Ideas were circulating rapidly in Ireland and in terms of language and method, English language print culture was rapidly superseding the use of Irish in either print or oral culture. Irish nationalist thought in terms of the ideology was outward looking. It reflected on the experiences of British imperialism elsewhere. It drew analogies and it sought a path forward in an international context. For Irish nationalist thinkers in the 19th century, the idea of creating distinct nation states is what they saw as the way forward. That was the way to preserve political liberties. This, these ideas have been totally undermined since then, and rightly so, in the context of Wilsonianism and 20th century developments. However, this was the prism through which they saw the world. So they looked outward in order to seek solutions for their own territories. In Ireland, the ideas that circulated related to criticism of the British Empire, and particularly of British actions in India. The Indian crisis occurred in 1857, which is around the same time as the first transatlantic cable was laid, which was lost. The Nation newspaper, which was the paper of Young Ireland, often drew imperialist parallels when discussing Irish issues, comparing treatment of Irish rebels with that meted out on rebels in Jamaica and in India. The nation even wrote of the undoing of the Celtic Hottentots of Skibbereen by Whig famine. Additionally, debates were had in Irish papers about the issue of slavery and the conditions of slaves. The Times of London viewed the Irish national question in this period firmly in an imperial context. They saw it as a choice between regional self-government and isolation or full participation in the British Empire and in imperial affairs alongside England. The Irish debate about imperial matters is an example in microcosm of debates that were happening across the globe. The imperial and international context provides much of the rationale behind the growth in international communications in the 19th century. As many people here will be aware, the first telegraph system was built by the armies of Napoleon using a system of towers and semaphores in the 1790s. The first long distance cables were government ventures in 1854, French and British governments paid New All & Co. £7,500 to lay a temporary unarmoured cable from Romania to the Crimea in support of an expedition against Russia. The priority of governments was to improve the infrastructure for communications with colonies, while business interests focused more on the North Atlantic. And in this regard, empire, colonies and business interests coalesced because Britain was then well placed to take advantage of the fact that it possessed both Ireland and Newfoundland, which contained the most easterly and westerly points on the Atlantic. This geographic reality helps to offset Ireland's poor reputation as a place of investment. It was very much uh, a global bat battle, the race for increased communications. France tried to get in on the game several times, tried unsuccessfully to undermine British dominance, in transatlantic telegraphic communications in the 1870s. But eventually, the French were forced to join what was known as a common purse, effectively a cartel. And it wasn't until 1900 that the great competitor Germany was able to set up its own infrastructure and cease reliance on British infrastructure. 
Irish society and politics existed in a wider context. It was imperial and it was international. Ireland was affected by, and to turn, affected developments around the world. Even the most narrow concern, the idea of what was happening at home, the, the preoccupation with nationhood and self-governance, it was understood within a wider context that cut through ethnicity, race, and religion. The concerns of empire and of international commercialization were integral to the development of communications technology. It was these interests, it was the fact of this geopolitical reality that made it a viable financial investment for entrepreneurs such as Cyrus Field. These wide-ranging concerns were the spurs to the growth of telegraphic communication, culminating in the laying of the transatlantic cable. The cable station was established in order to facilitate international communication, and thereby it assisted the process of globalization, and it was indeed an important watershed in the overall history of communications. So thank you very much. <laughs>